Uh, my name is Alexa Fenn, and I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator with the Alliance. I'm so happy that all of you could join us here this afternoon. We're incredibly grateful to have Sarah Hawkins Smith with the Tahoe Institute for Natural Science here today. She is here to teach us all about birds of the Sierra, specifically birds you can find right now during the winter months. Sarah has led a very active lifestyle, but always have time to slow down and watch the birds sing. After working for the US Forest Service, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, and various other government agencies and natural resources and sciences, Sarah decided to settle down her migration and is a full-time naturalist and outreach director for the Tahoe Institute for Natural Science. With a smile on her face and her binoculars in hand, she researches birds in the Tahoe region as well as leads wildflower, geology, and bird tours throughout the Sierra Nevada. If you have any questions during this webinar, please feel free to add them to the chat and I will share them with Sarah as they apply or we can we'll have a little Q&A at the end. Um, and Sarah will discuss this a bit more and how this is all gonna work. So with that, I will pass it over to Sarah. Sarah, welcome and thank you, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Alexa and Jennifer for having me and the Sierra Nevada Alliance. Um, my name is Sarah Hawkinsmith. Again, I'm the outreach director for TENS or the Tahoe Institute for Natural Science. So I will be sharing my screen here in a moment to start a PowerPoint presentation. But uh, like Alexa said, if you do decide to ask a question, please type it in the chat box. I personally will not be able to see your questions, but Alexa or Jennifer will um, interrupt me, which is completely fine, and uh, let me know your questions. So I'm really excited to um, see what you guys have to say, what questions you have. So feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation. So I am going to share my screen. And it takes a moment. All right. Uh, and uh, Jennifer or Alexa, just let me know that's confirmed that you can see my screen. And I will yes. go to my presentation. You probably don't want to see my data for that very confusing thing I just showed. Okay, so here we go. Loading, Sierra Nevada birds, what can you find? Um, so before we get into birds, I just wanna do a brief overview of the Tahoe Institute for Natural Science. We are a member supported nonprofit similar to the, uh, the Alliance. And uh, we have three pillars uh, under which we conduct just general um, information about natural history. So we have our education pillar. So we go into the school, we have summer camps and we reach out to the youth here in the local area to have place-based education. Um, we take kids out on field trips. Uh, we also have them come and watch us conduct uh, research. So they'll come watch us bird band or collect data so they can actually see scientists at work. Um, and I've also created a bird club at some of the local elementary schools. So kids come bird watching with me before school. So it's pretty fun. In addition, um, it's not really letting me. Okay. In addition, we also have outreach opportunities that anybody on this in this presentation can be a part of. We provide 20 to 40 nature walks that are all free throughout the year, whether it's snowshoe tours, bird walks, wildflower walks. Um, geology talks. Um, so, and we always are looking for people to help us with those as well um, throughout the region in Tahoe and Truckee. And then sometimes we head down to the Mono Lake area and the Yosemite region to give bird tours down there. Um, and then we also provide lectures like right now. And then we also conduct citizen science. So we have a few different opportunities that I'll um, present on throughout this uh, talk today. And then what sets us apart from a lot of different nonprofits in the area that conduct, you know, or they teach kids about local natural history is we're actually hands-on collecting data and researching different flora and fauna in the basin. Primarily we research birds, um, passerines, um, but we also conduct research on lagomorphs such as snowshoe hare and white-tailed jackrabbit, as well as yellow jackets and whatever uh, research contract we will um, uh, get from a different governmental entity and we sign on with them as biologists. So going, moving on to our presentation, birding 101. So I decided to create this presentation more so for beginner birders with a sprinkle of advanced and intermediate knowledge. 
Um, but I did want to make sure that if you aren't super familiar with birds that you'll be able to understand what's going on throughout the presentation. Now, um, I'm, uh, quickly, Alexa and Jen, if you guys can quickly uh, admit the people from the waiting room, because it's hard for me to click to the next slide if they're not admitted. Thanks. So uh, to start birding, uh, it's great to get a few things. Um, first of all, you can get a field guide. And I, I, if you're in the Sierra Nevada, I would suggest getting Sibley's Bird Guide to the West. Um, I really like the illustrations and descriptions throughout that guide. Also, you can use an online um, piece, which is eBird. So if you wanted to go out and bird watch or learn more, you can just download the app and it's really simple to use. Um, if you're looking to get binoculars, I would suggest starting with 8x32 binoculars and as you become more advanced to upgrade to 10x42s. Um, so then you can see more strongly but without less distraction around your glass. Um, also bringing a notepad and a pencil out while you're birding is really important um, so you can collect notes. Another thing, another resource that you can utilize um, is our Birds of the Lake Tahoe Basin. Even if you're outside the basin, it's a it's a good it's a nice tool to see what birds occur in high elevation mountain habitat. Um, and there's about I think 316 different birds of when they occur and what time of year and how rare they are. And if you guys want to put that link in the chat box, you can download that PDF for free. Um, but we created that for birders here in the area. And then also just learning your different uh, uh, field traits of these birds while you go out there. I know it could be pretty confusing, but start with just the simple stuff and then um, go from there. Now, we will be talking a lot about uh, birds of the Lake Tahoe Basin uh, and Truckee, but this applies to a lot of the Sierra Nevada and I'll kind of compare and contrast some differences that occur in Tahoe opposed to other areas in the Sierra Nevada, which is a very, very big range. So we have over 320 different species that inhabit this region in, uh, in, in the Tahoe area, um, but about 65 stay here year, year round because we are above the snow level and we do get a lot of precipitation in the winter and a lot of snow load. Um, so that being said, most of our birds are mostly migratory, meaning that they stop either for a day briefly or they'll come for the whole summer to breed. Um, there's all different types of migration, but we get all different types of migrants in the winter, the summer, the fall, and the spring. We have a lot of uh, summer nesters that come here specifically to the Sierra Nevada to breed, um, and that encompasses a lot of different warblers and um, flycatchers and, and so on. So quickly just talking about the Sierra Nevada region, it's huge and it occupies a lot of the California state. And if you go down to the south part of the Sierra Nevada Nevada region, you're going to get more birds that might occupy closer to Mexico than you will Canada. So today I can't really touch on a lot of the birds that inhabit the Sierra Nevada, but I'll do my best to answer any questions that you may have. And why the birds differentiate between other regions, even if it's just 10 miles away over, over a hill, is because it depends on the vegetation and the soil that is growing or it, is in that area and habits that area. So slope aspect, soil type, hydrology, hydrology, and then just smaller microclimates will determine what birds will be in what area. But when I like to think of anything like that, I just think of what's the food source and then what will eat that food. And that's what you can determine what will be in that area. So moving on to birds, I wanted to start with raptors since it is the winter and we are getting a lot of snow here in the, in the high elevations here in Nevada. And that brings in a lot of raptors from the, from the north. So I wanted to briefly just introduce you to the red-tailed hawk. Most of you have seen it before, and a lot of you can identify it based on its tail. But that's not the best way to do so. So red-tailed hawks, just like a lot of different birds, it can be a bit confusing because some birds will have different morphs. They'll look different from when they're a juvenile versus an adult. And sometimes certain birds can look different when they're either male or female. So I wanted to point out how you can tell the differences between red-tailed hawks. All three of these pictures are red-tailed hawk. Um, the best way to tell is if you have a darker head, then you have a lighter upper breast, dark belly band, and then it gets light again. So dark, light, dark, light. Dark, light, dark, light. So that belly band right there is the best way to, to tell if it's a red-tailed hawk. 
aside from it having a red tail. So that's um, that's a, a good distinct way to figure out what hawk you're looking at in the Sierra Nevada. So another thing that I wanted to point out is even when these birds are younger, they'll have a yellow eye. And as they age, the one to the right will have a dark eye, meaning it's an adult, which it will have a red tail, a dark eye when it's an adult, but it'll have a light eye and not a red tail when it's a juvenile. So it's important to know these other field marks to be able to determine what bird it is, um, instead of just looking at what the adult plumage would look like. In flight, red tail hawks, um, sometimes will have that red tail, sometimes it will be white, but the wet best way to tell it is a red tail during flight is it has that dark belly band and also on its shoulders here, the Europatagiums, um, there'll be some like darker spots towards the top part of the wing. And that's how you can um, help determine it's a red tail hawk. And most of you, when you see hawks, you're, it's 99% of the time will be a red tail hawk if you're in Tahoe. Now, if you go down slope, if you're in Auburn area, you might get more red shouldered hawks, but that's how you can differentiate a red tail from others. So other birds we have, other raptors we have in Tahoe include the peregrine falcon, of which is one of our main research topics the past few years. Um, this is uh, not the best picture, but I've been researching a scrape in South Lake Tahoe at uh, Castle Rock. And um, for a while, because of recreators uh, rock climbing on the specific uh, rock structure, had scared a lot of the peregrines away. So we decided to come up with and um, create some signs um, in order to uh, detour people from climbing. And we've actually had multiple success stories the past three years with um, three peregrines fledging last year at Castle Rock and two peregrines fledging this, uh, sorry, in 2020, we had three birds fledge. And then in 2021, we had two birds fledge and we're going to be researching again this year. So pretty excited to see that. So I just wanted to show you in the scrape, which is the nest where they uh, nest on cliff sides. There's this little white puffy ball right in the middle of that scrape. And that's um, what it looks like on the right-hand side is a big fluffy down feathered peregrine. So pretty cool to see in the Sierra Nevada region as well. So um, we have some pretty rare hawks, I would say that come down to this area um, that come from the Arctic. So if you're looking at the North Pole, you're looking at the, the tip top of uh, North American continent where you're seeing Alaska and other, other areas. Um, this is where the rough-legged hawk will um, live in the summertime, but they actually will migrate down to Carson Valley, Sierra Valley and other um, field areas in the wintertime and inhabit these regions, um, December, January and February. So right now, if you were to head out to any of those areas that I just mentioned, you could see red tail, uh, sorry, rough leg hawks. Now rough leg hawks, um, when in flight, they'll have these dark patches on their wrists, these dark black wrist patches. And that's a great way to tell the two, the, the rough leg apart. And also um, it has a really dark belly band, a lot lower, but it doesn't go like a red tail hawk, doesn't have that dark, light, dark, light pattern. It's just all dark at the bottom. And a lot of the times when I see rough leg hawks, rock rough leg hawks they're perched on the ground they're not necessarily in a tree they're just in the middle of a field so kind of cool also in flight the uh the rough leg hawk will um hover similar to a kestrel or a white-tailed kite and it will flap its wings in the same stationary spot um, which is uh not many other hawks will do that so that's another way you can tell a rough leg hawk and it's a good time to see them right now if you have any time to shoot over to Carson Valley or um, Sierra Valley or around the, the fields in the Reno area um, because they should be here for the next month or so. Another uh, wintering hawk that comes down from up north um, include the ferruginous hawk. Uh, ferruginous means a rusty color. Um, and so a good way to tell the ferruginous hawk in flight is it has a V that surrounds its um, its legs, it's kind of hard to see in this photo, but that's a good way to tell. But also um, it has feathers that come all the way down to its feet and it's typically mostly white. So um, it, you can get a dark morph uh, ferruginous hawk, which makes things a little bit more complicated, but they're not as common as the, the ones in a lighter morph. Uh, another thing to point out with the ferruginous hawks is that they have this long gape 
kind of, I think about Bat Batman and Joker where the gape goes far out into its cheek, uh, giving it a big smile, but that's another way, another characteristic of the, uh, of the ferruginous hawk. Raptors continued. Uh, if you're in the Auburn area or Yosemite or a little bit lower in elevation, uh, red-shouldered hawks are more prevalent opposed to Tahoe. Um, we have a few uh, red-shouldered hawks in the region, but they're not as prevalent as lower elevations below 6,000 and 5,000 feet. And then throughout all of the Sierra Nevada, you can easily spot um, uh, marsh hawks or also known as um, northern harriers and this is a male because he's gray with this white rump and they like to fly low over fields and search for mice and different lemmings and voles so um, that's one that you can keep your eyes out for especially right now in the winter time so i think my slideshow was a little bit messed up but i just wanted to point out with the peregrine falcon nest uh, we've been creating some signs with local organizations to make it so Climbers and hikers don't impact the nesting status of these of these peregrines in the region. And this is a study that's um, trying to be based in terms of most of the Sierra Nevada. So we're using this study to see how it will affect other um, uh, birds in, in Yosemite and other region. Hold on. All right. So in this picture, I see three different birds. I see three different eagles. And I think it's important to note that uh, when you're looking at this picture, it's all the same species. So here on the right hand side is a bald eagle, um, a full adult year five, white head, white tail. But this is also a bald eagle in the middle. And there's also a bald eagle here on the left hand side. So again, birds can be a little bit confusing. And um, the first year of a bald eagle, they're all dark brown. They almost look like a golden eagle. So there's a couple slight differences. Um, but a bald eagle actually doesn't get a white head and a fully white tail until age five. So it's important to know the different morphs and years of the juvenile birds um, leading up until they get their, their uh, adult plumages. So I wanted to briefly just chat of how you can tell the, the bald eagle versus a golden eagle. Well, golden eagles, they have this beautiful orange or golden nape. So the back of the neck is called a nape on a bird. And that's a really, really great way to, to tell the difference. Also, I feel as if the golden eagle's bill just looks a lot more appropriately fitting to the face where a bald eagle's just looks really goofy and a lot larger. Um, golden eagles feathers come all the way down to their toes, whereas bald eagles don't have feathers that come all the way down. And obviously there's different white patches on the bald eagle versus the golden eagle. Um, but that's a good way to tell the differences between the two. And golden eagles, although female bald eagles can be really, really large as well, a golden eagle is massive. Um, and if you see just a massive bird, all dark with that golden nape on top of a a fence post or a telephone pole, you're more, most likely looking at a golden eagle or you are. Um, but speaking of eagles and why a lot of these birds even come to this, uh, to this here in Nevada, well, specifically bald eagles is because they're feeding on waterfowl because Lake Tahoe doesn't freeze and high elevation lakes, when they don't freeze, waterfowl will flock there from the north and they'll feed and overwinter in which their predators, AKA bald eagles, will come and feed on coots and buffalo heads and smaller waterfowl that inhabit these high elevation lakes that aren't frozen. Um, whereas the frugianous hawk, that rough leg hawk that I was talking about that came from the Arctic, they're coming down because they're also feeding on rodents in the fields um, that surround these high elevation um, mountain towns. In the, in the valleys and the meadows, they come down and they feed on those small small rodents, which is different from bald eagles. Now, another reason why bald eagles will flock in those fields surrounding, um, you know, Reno Carson, anything that's a large field that's an ag field, is because in the winter time is the time where cows will give birth. And so their stillborns and afterbirth placenta is what golden eagles and bald eagles will feed on in the surrounding cattle fields around Tahoe and around the Sierra Nevada. So birds will also migrate to eat and scavenge off those things which sounds a little gross, but we actually give a lot of tours to go see you know, 15 bald eagles at a time in these fields. Um, one of the things that we do at TINS is we do uh, transect uh, raptor counts uh, as part of data collection. 
and we can count up to 180 birds in just a few hours. So lots of golden eagles, ferruginous, rough leg, lots of different eagles and hawks. Um, but it wasn't always that way or this way in terms of having these large amount of eagles and hawks in the area. In the 70s, thank goodness they banned DDT, but population levels of bald eagle and other, um, other birds that ate waterfowl or fed from streams and rivers were affected, their eggs were affected by the insecticide that was not great for uh, birds' eggs. And so if you're looking at the number of uh, how many bald eagles used to live in the Tahoe region opposed to now, it's, a, it's significantly different. So we started this count called the Midwinter Bald Eagle Count where the Forest Service started it in the late 70s. <clears throat> and at that time, they had very few eagles. So it's, it's the second Friday in January and there's a bunch of different locations you go to and we have a big group of volunteers. We go out, we have eyes on the lake and we look for bald eagles in that three hour period. If you find them, you send in your data back to now tens and we calculate that and we graph it. Now in the 70s or in 1980, there was zero bald eagles seen um, in Lake Tahoe. And actually last year we had in the 40s of a bald eagle scene. And that was a conservative estimate because when we were calculating the data, um, we weren't super confident in people's observations. So we actually lessened the, or we, we didn't want the numbers to be as, to jump that much. But basically what I'm saying is bald eagles have skyrocketed in a, terms of a bounce back from having a, an environmental disaster with DDT. So it's a good thing that um, we banned that insecticide and we are able to continuously count these, uh, these birds to see the bounce back um, and actually a good story in science these days. And if you want to be, uh, I have, uh, if the girls, Alexa or Jenny, want to put that link in the, in the chat box, if you want to sign up for the Bald Eagle count, we're still looking for more volunteers um, to help out with that. Um, it's next Friday on the 14th in, in Lake Tahoe. So again, bald eagles come up here to, to feed on waterfowl in the Lake Tahoe specific area. Although a lot of times bald eagles scavenge off other, um, other birds, um, their food. For example, an osprey, when it migrates here in the summertime, catches a fish, bald eagle, take that fish away. It's kind of a bummer, but it's just how it is out there. So I, this is my transition into ducks, um, different types of ducks that live in, in Tahoe. Um, but I wanted to inform you that there's diving ducks and then there's dabbling, dabbling ducks. So diving ducks fully submerge themselves underneath the water and to feed on uh, small crustaceans or plants or fish. Um, whereas dabbling ducks only stick their tails up in the air and they don't fully submerge to go underneath the feed. And that's the differences uh, in terms of behavior. So if you're new to birds, there's a dabbling duck se section in your field guide and the diving duck section. So if you're a beginner, you should try to look at the behavior before identifying. Um, a couple other um, physical attributes that you can dif differentiate between diving and dabbling is diving ducks typically have legs way farther back on the body because you typically don't see diving ducks on land unless they're nesting in cavities, so old woodpecker holes or holes in trees. Where dabbling ducks, you can see um, more frequently walking onto land to sleep, nap, um, for example, mallards or something like that. We do have one um, question. Yeah. Go ahead. Back on the bald eagle count. Yeah. Um, so we have the question um, that I'm curious how you know that you are counting 30 different bald eagles versus the same bald eagle flying back and forth 30 <laughs> times. That's a <laughs> That's great a question. question. <laughs> so um, it's a 72 mile, um, it's 72 miles around Lake Tahoe and we have 20 stations of where we put people. And so there's number one, you can age a bald eagle from year one to year five. So if you see an adult bald eagle flying versus a year one juvenile flying, those are two separate birds. Also, you can see birds at different times. But what when people are collecting the data, you when you see the bird, you you mark exactly what time you saw it, what it was doing when you saw it. And then when it if it flies away, you count you you write down which direction it's flying and at what time. So the person at the next station, if there's an adult bald eagle flying five minutes 
after the station next to it, then we won't recount that eagle. And a lot of the times eagles will stay perched for the entirety of the count. And if we have birds flying in directions, we don't, we don't ever double count those eagles, if that answers your question. And we have a, I have a whole map. And if you have more questions about that, I can send you more data about the bald eagle count. But um, it's, it's, we actually are way more conservative in um, estimating where eagles fly. And it's at least in the 40s now um, in terms of 2021. All right, so we'll keep going with the dabbling ducks. So those are the ones that only stick their tails up when they're looking for food in the water. So one of the most beautiful dabbling ducks, in my opinion, is the wood duck, um, which also, just like the bald eagles, has had a huge bounce back, bounce back in terms of population status because of conservation efforts um, surrounding the Sierra Nevada and throughout the U.S. Um, but really beautiful bird, uh, also nests in cavities, um, which is uh, holes in trees. So really beautiful bird you can see in the area. Mallards, we don't really have to talk too much about mallards, but when we look at female uh, ducks, a lot of female ducks do look very, very similar. So I like to point out that if you're looking at a female duck, if you see a dark line that goes over the eye, it's most likely a mallard. So that's a good way to, to check mark off what, what you're looking at. Um, we have widgeons in the area. We have American and Eurasian, Eurasian widgeon. Obviously, the Eurasian is less common, but we do have them here in the Sierra Nevada. Northern pintails, a beautiful bird. Obviously, if you go down a lower elevation in the winter around, you know, uh, Sacramento valleys or any of the, the lower elevation valleys, you'll see a lot more waterfowl, but you can still see them throughout the whole Sierra Nevada. You have all three species of teal, so green winged teal, blue winged teal, and cinnamon teal. Cinnamon teal is here, the all orange duck, really beautiful. Green wing has this uh, greenish head, and then the blue winged teal has this like white lore mask. Now moving on to diving ducks, I'm sure if you live in the Sierra Nevada, um, you've seen common merganser. Uh, the female is the one with the crest or also known as a, a mohawk for birds. And the male looks kind of similar to a mallard but has that more slender bill. Hold on. Then we also have hooded mergansers that are uh, throughout the whole entire Sierra Nevada. Um, just people coming in and out, sorry. And then we also get different, the both, or we both you get both species of golden eye. So we have common golden eye. You see the white dot on the face. It's like a circle. Whereas the barrow's golden eye looks more like a comma. And that's the, the, one of the better ways you can tell the difference between the two birds. But also the scapulars on the back, you see more white dots opposed to the black wing, which is much different from the, the common golden eye. Now, barrow's golden eye, the more rare golden eye that uh, inhabit the Sierra Nevada. They actually used to breed in Lake Tahoe, but the last known pair for, or the last known nest uh, was in 1917. So they haven't bred here in a long time and they're breeding more up north. Um, same with Harlequin ducks, which we don't really have in Tahoe or really the Sierra Nevada anymore, unless you're going up more towards Humboldt. And then you can see more of those ducks there. Uh, a bird that has increased um, in terms of breeding is the bufflehead. It's a small duck that bald eagles also like to feed on um, because it is a smaller bird. But this, uh, this bird um, will also nest in cavities, so holes in trees. Also birds that will nest in cavities include mergansers. So they'll fly out into the forest closest to water. They'll find an old flicker hole or maybe where a bear was able to get into a tree and then they'll have their babies. Babies will jump out and they'll go to the water source um, when they're able to, uh, when they hatch and they're ready. So pretty neat that birds that live most of their life in the water will spend the beginning of their life uh, living in a tree. Ruddy ducks are another um, diving duck. Uh, Justin Mammoth, I think over this last snowstorm, they found a male ruddy duck um, in the middle of the, the ski slope. So something that happened in the Sierra Nevada, pretty random wasn't near a uh, uh, freshwater non-frozen pond. So, you know, there's a lot of different rarities and weather can make it so certain birds can be in certain areas at different times. So rarities do occur. That's a female ruddy duck. Um, we, uh, in the Sierra Nevada, 
and especially in large lakes like Lake Tahoe or Mono Lake, um, we will get uh, ocean dwelling birds. So scoters, white winged scoter, black scoter, uh, sorry, surf scoter, black scoter, or white winged scoter. We will get all three of those in Lake Tahoe. Other high alpine lakes that are larger will sometimes get these, um, these scoters, but they primarily spend well, they spend most of their life in the ocean, the Pacific Ocean, um, and rarely come to land to begin with. And so when we have, whenever we have a scoter or a rare ocean bird come to Tahoe, it's a pretty big deal. And this past, um, just about a month and a half ago, I think we had eight or nine surf scoters, which is the one with the really funny looking bill on the, the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, eight of them showed up and one was injured and had to be taken to wildlife care. So a lot of uh, interesting rarities that have occurred in, in this area. We also um, get rare gulls, similar to Mono Lake. We have a Sabine's gull, which is also a plague uh, bird species that spends most of its time by the ocean, but will inhabit um, high elevation lakes as well. And I did want to mention that uh, in 2020 in the South Yosemite entrance, there was a rarity of a brown booby, which is a bird you'd maybe see in Mexico or Hawaii. And it occurred, um, it just showed up one day in a friend of ours yard. So you never know what's going to show up depending on the weather or <clears throat> just birds being younger juvenile males. A lot of times will go wander and they get lost. So that's just sometimes what happens. <clears throat> so moving away from ducks, waterfowl, and raptors, we're going to go into winter dwelling birds that you can see right now in Tahoe and mostly in the Sierra Nevada. We're going to start with the nuthatches. So we have all three different species of nuthatch that inhabit most of the Sierra Nevada, specifically in Tahoe as well. Um, we have the red-breasted nuthatch. Um, and this is, uh, I actually, this, this sound should be under the red-breasted nuthatch opposed to the white-breasted but I wanted you all to hear what it sounds like because you could hear it in the winter. Sounds similar to a, 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 a horn-based uh, car alarm. If you're hiking or skiing or walking through the forest, a lot of times if you hear that sound, you're most likely hearing a red-breasted nuthatch. So, pretty prevalent throughout the Sierra Nevada. We also have the white-breasted nuthatch, clearly it's named or coined because of the white breast. And then we also have the smallest uh, species of um, pygmy nuthatch as well. Now, um, there's different subspecies of nuthatches. It's really tough to tell visually the difference between a white-breasted nuthatch that's Pacific Slope versus a white-breasted nuthatch that is um, a Great Basin subspecies. They look identical in in person but they sound completely different so knowing what a bird sounds like can help you figure out what species that is the one that um, lives primarily in in high elevation areas or pine areas is the tenuissima which is the 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 species uh the subspecies for the white-breasted nuthatch that lives in um pine dwelling area. So if you go down to Auburn or you have you go to Yosemite or any place that there's oak savannas, um, you'll get the Pacific Slope white-breasted nuthatch. Whereas if you're at high elevations with pine forests, you'll have the white-breasted nuthatch. And so knowing the different sounds will help you differentiate those two. Um, pretty sure a lot of you are familiar with the mountain chickadee. Um, it's different than a couple other different chickadees that live in the state of California but um, they are the ones that go <whistles> cheeseburger, uh, they're the cheeseburger birds. And uh, they are also a resident of the Sierra Nevada and they don't migrate, they'll stay there year round because they're able to find food source in the winter, whether they're frozen insects or arachnids, um, seeds, um, and in the summertime flying insects or seeds, uh, they won't leave because they have a food source. Um, but if anybody is living in the Tahoe area, a place that you could go to and visit to feed chickadees from your hand, um, if you are okay with that, with your ethics, um, you can go up to Chickadee Ridge and snowshoe up there. And the chickadee, the chickadees, mountain chickadees will feed from your hands. But we ask that when people do that, they feed only natural foods and uh, specifically just use uh, black, unoiled, unsalted sunflower seeds. So 
if you're interested in doing that, um, a boost in calories is something for me ethically is not a bad thing. They're not super, they're habituated for the winter, but they won't stay there during the summer months. They'll go and disperse and find their own food. Um, there might be more of a population density in that area, but it's not necessarily affecting the population too much. So we encourage people to have that nature experience up at Chickadee Ridge. <clears throat> Another bird that you can see while you're at Chickadee Ridge or throughout the Sierra Nevada at high alpine areas. So all the way down to Mammoth or up to Mount Whitney. Um, any place that has white bark pine, which is um, a, a tree with five needles in the white pine family. They specifically live in areas with those trees and they feed on the seeds and then they'll go and cache those seeds in large pile caches underneath the soil, the perfect germination depth. And then they'll remember over 90% of the seeds that they've cached, but the few that they forget, they'll turn into little stands of white bark pine. And they're actually just basically white bark pine gardeners, um, gardeners uh, where they also reap the benefits of the seeds. So it's pretty cool. They're in the corvid family. So corvid meaning jays, ravens, magpies, um, which we're moving on to the next bird, which is a stellar's jay. So um, stellar's jays might annoy a lot of people, but they're one of the smartest birds that live in the Sierra Nevada. Um, other areas that are a little bit lower, you can get scrub jays, either Woodhouse scrub jay or California scrub jay. But I think what's most important to remember are the jays that live here in the in California and in the Sierra Nevada are not blue jays, although they're jays and they're blue. Blue jays live on the east side of the Rocky Mountains and stellar jays in the high alpine areas live on the west side of the Rockies. And that's how you can tell um, the difference in terms of uh, a map. Now they look a lot different, white face, a completely different blue, um, but pretty neat and good to know if you wanna become a birder, especially, in the Sierra Nevada, it's not a blue jay, it's a stellar jay or a scrub jay. And if you're by pinion pines um, out by Travertine Hot Springs or somewhere around the Sierra Nevada there, the pinion pines um, will produce a lot of pinion jays, um, which are a really beautiful bird and not as common as our stellar jay. Uh, just a little reminder for those that didn't know this, um, blue, so there's different pigments in birds. You know, you have your carotenoid pigments. There are those oranges and yellows. Um, like in flamingos or in western tanagers, you have that red face. And that pigment um, is created due to the diet that they're eating. They're absorbing those pigments and that, that feather is becoming that color. Now, blue is actually not um, a pigment at all. Um, it's just an illusion of what you see when the sun hits off a feather. It makes it look like it's blue, but it's actually a grayish or a brown. So um, when you look at you know blue jay or a bluebird or a stellar's jay, um, they are actually not blue at all. It's just what the illusion that you're seeing with your eyes. So kind of cool. Um, the main uh, higher elevation uh, corvid that we have is the common raven. But again, if you go into lower elevations, you'll see the smaller corvid, which is the, um, the, uh, the crow, the American crow. But a good way to tell the difference is not size and sound. But when a raven's in flight, its tail looks like a diamond, um, where a crow's does not. So that's a good way to tell the difference between the two. Uh, if you enjoy snowshoeing or skiing at higher elevations, I suggest that you get to know the Townsend solitaire. Um, it's one of two birds that will sing year round. So it'll sing in the wintertime, not to copulate, but just because it's claiming its territory. The other bird that we'll see in the wintertime is the red crossbill, but they will breed in the wintertime. There's enough food and there's the capability to do so. They can breed at any time of year. So that's pretty neat as well. Speaking of red crossbill, here in the bottom left corner um, is a red crossbill as their bills will cross to pry open seeds. We also, throughout the Sierra Nevada, if you go to high elevations, you have the gray crown rosy finch, which is a huge bird for California. A lot of people love to, Put this one on their life list and check it off because it's a high elevation finch. And in the Sierra Nevada, we have a lot of different types of finches because we have a lot of different types of pines and seeds, um, which draw in a lot of the, the finches that surround. And above here is just the pine gross beak, really beautiful red that again, the food that they eat, that carotenoid pigment, it's absorbed through that their diet. 
Uh, I am a little bit, I'm running, I have about eight minutes until questions. So I'm gonna skip past the warblers because they aren't a winter species. But if you have questions at the end, just let me know. Um, throughout the Sierra Nevada, we have a we have a diversity of owls, um, ranging from really tiny owls like the northern pygmy owl, all the way to large great horned owls, which are both pretty common if you know where to look. Um, some bird, some the great gray owl um, is not known to live in Tahoe, but in the surrounding areas north of Tahoe. Um, also, you can find them in Yosemite, so a good bird that you can look at if you're outside of the Tahoe region. Um, in Tahoe, we have 11 different types of owls. Um, and what's interesting about owls in general is they have very large eye sockets that um, take up the majority of their skull. Um, and if you ever find a, a, a feather on the ground and you, and you see the feather at the very tips of the feather, it looks really frayed or disheveled. A lot of times that could be a owl feather because the tips of their, their, feathers are just really rough because it silences their flight so then they can feed on prey especially at night so pretty cool adaptation that they have another cool adaptation that uh, owls have is that they can rotate their heads 270 degrees um, and they are able to do so because they have a blood pooling system that allows blood and oxygen to continue to flow to their brains so they're able to rotate and find food um, another fact just because i really like owls is they don't have eyeballs like we do where we can move our eyes back and forth. Their eyes are more like binoculars, they're cylinder and they're, they're stationary, they won't move. So that's why they have to move their heads and they look sometimes pretty goofy when they're looking at things. Um, so on the top right corner is a Northern Pygmy Owl. Bottom right corner is a Great Horned Owl. And then on our bottom left is a Burrowing Owl which will occupy a lot of the different areas in the Sierra Nevada. Um, uh, the gray horned owl right now should be, I would say, actually not now, but in a few weeks at higher elevations, they should be looking for a mate. So if you're starting to hear the hooting or the mating calls um, to find a mate in order to make these little fluffy owlets um, come early, early spring, that's what's going on. If you have, you know, closer down, uh, lower elevations in the Sierra Nevada, they should start to um, look for a mate around now. Um, so listening for them and, you know, following them around and trying to find an owl nest would be really cool and unique. Um, but that's something that's happening. They're one of the first um, birds to um, lay eggs um, in, the, in the calendar year. Uh, so I did want to mention briefly, or I did want to talk about uh, the Christmas bird count. We actually just had our Christmas bird count two weeks ago, right before Christmas. Um, and it is a citizen science count. It's one of the longest citizen science counts in the world. Um, it began in the 1900s where somebody uh, named uh, Frank Chapman, um, he was the Audubon Society in the 1900, and he took 27 birders and decided to count birds um, and see how many they can find in, a, in that 24 hours. But um, where before the Christmas bird count, they actually used to go out around Christmas day and shoot as many birds as they can find in a day. Um, and as bird populations were plummeting because of a behavior like that, um, they decided to start counting them instead of hunting them, or I wouldn't even call that hunting. So um, that's how that citizen science count began. And now uh, TINS, Tahoe Institute for Natural Science, we host the South Lake Tahoe Christmas bird count um, each year. Um, and there still might be a couple more left in this year in Nevada. I'm not quite sure the, quite sure the date, but, um, wherever you are in the Sierra Nevada range, there probably is a Christmas bird count within a five to 10 mile radius of where you live. So I would definitely look into the link that Alexa or Jen will put into the chat box. If you want to, um, uh, be a part of a Christmas bird count in the future. Uh, speaking of counting woodpeckers, we have a, quite the variety of woodpecker in uh, the Sierra Nevada, um, ranging from the largest woodpecker being the pileated woodpecker, which is over a foot tall, um, and all the way to Lewis's woodpecker, which reminds me of Christmas because it's red and, and green, all the way to different sapsuckers like this female Williamson's with the yellow belly 
and this red-breasted sapsucker on the bottom right. And we also have a Sierra Nevada specific woodpecker that lives in our area, it's the white-headed woodpecker. And it really only breeds in the Sierra Nevada and then barely into the Cascade range. But a lot of people from around the US, if they are big birders and they want to add more species to their, to their life lists, they'll come out to Tahoe or Yosemite or um, Sierra, the Sierra Nevada to look for white-headed woodpeckers. So pretty cool. A couple more facts about woodpeckers before we get into questions is that they have such strong bills that they're able to tap into a tree at more force than a jet taking off into space. And the way that they're able to do so is by having a tongue that when they poke a hole into a tree and they stick their tongue into that tree, they can retrieve the insect. But once they retract their tongue back into their head, their tongue actually splits in the back and wraps around their whole skull through their nostril and actually acts as a seat belt for their brain. So when they're drilling into a tree, either to create a cavity for nesting or looking for food or claiming territory, it doesn't cause brain damage. So woodpeckers are very, very unique and have great adaptations in order to survive. Here's a Northern flicker. I'm starting to lose some time. So um, I'm gonna uh, buzz past this, but this is one of the most uh, common uh, woodpeckers we have in the Sierra Nevada is our Northern flicker. Males have a red mallard stripe or mustache where the females lack that. So if you are interested in birding, if you haven't been involved in that before, um, a couple tips to become a better bird watcher is to start paying attention. Just going outside, I guarantee you'll find lots of birds if you just start. Um, and then learning the common birds. So I went over a couple common birds today, a couple more rare birds today, but knowing the common ones really, really well and then seeing that a bird's different from the one that you know, then you'll be able to determine that it's a different species and learn from there. And that brings us to keeping a checklist. It's important if you, if you wanna become a better birder to keep track of what you're seeing, writing descriptions of those birds. Um, also noting behaviors, like if I see a bird going from a top of the tree, going out and coming back very quickly and doing that over and over again, it's more than likely a flycatcher and then I'll be able to figure out what, where to look in the field guide. So also noticing behaviors is very helpful with bird watching as well. Again, like I ex explained with dabbling ducks versus diving ducks, you can tell the differences. Um, and then also, I mean, we lead 30 to 50 different tours a year. So you can come out with us in Yosemite, Truckee, Reno, Carson, Tahoe, um, throughout the whole area, a lot of the Sierra Nevada, obviously not very south, but um, you come out with us and um, learn about different birds that uh, reside in these areas. And it's a lot different bird watching outside and learning the birds than learning it virtually, especially in a presentation where we can take time to look at the bird and we can go over the field guide and you can write it down, whatever your learning style is, um, we can adapt to. Another uh, tip that uh, might be important is if you are wanting to get into bird watching, also using your ears in, in addition to your sight to find these birds. Um, I would start with learning the most common birds um, and then going from there. And what bird that you should definitely learn if you're wanting to become a birder is the American Robin. Because there's two other birds that sound exactly like it, but one is just faster and one has a more horsey sound, but it sounds almost identical. So that's why it's important to learn certain bird songs. So uh, I think we're gonna break now and we're gonna look into questions. Um, if anybody has any in the chat box, uh, I don't know if anybody has had any Alexa or Jen, but this is the time where we're opening that up. Yes, we already have one question. Thank you, Sarah, so much for your incredible presentation. We've learned so much. Um, if anyone else, like Sarah says, has any more questions, please feel free to add them to our chat box. But in the meantime, um, our first question was about binoculars and a couple of questions. Oh, I see. Which have, yeah, which have the best image stabilization and what do you recommend for night vision for owls, et cetera? Oh gosh, night vision. I would just use, um, I would look into owls in your area and you can use eBird for that and I'd listen for them. 
So find out what vocalizations they create. And then that's the best way to identify them opposed to using night vision goggles or sorry, night, night vision uh, binoculars. I would also recommend if you uh, getting the best binoculars for your budget. Uh, again, eight by 32s is a great beginner pair um, and intermediate pair. And then as you become more advanced, 10 by 42s is a good, um, the, the good measurement for what binoculars you want. I like to have people look at Vortex because it's pretty inexpensive and pin tax. But if you wanted to get great binoculars, your first pair and your budget, you have a budget for it, the Monarch Nikons sevens are really good. And if you have a big budget, Swarovskis are where I intend on, uh, that's what I want in my future, <laughs> but I don't have them yet. I'm also seeing a question that says, what bird is on the tins logo? Um, that is a Western tanager. It's a bird that migrates from Central and sometimes South America, comes all the way to the Sierra Nevada and breeds in mixed conifers like Jeffrey Pines. Um, they, they breed in almost Oriole-like nests and they feed on insects and seeds. And then they also get that red face derived from what they eat. And then come wintertime, they go down to Central and South America. Really, really beautiful bird. I'm also seeing another question from Susan. Do you encourage or discourage bird feeders? Um, I think because you know humans have encroached so much on bird habitat, for my personal opinion, I think re having a responsible feeder out is a good thing. Um, but that means you have to clean it very frequently to avoid transmitting disease and then keeping up to keeping up with what's going on in the birding world. For example, at the beginning of 2021, uh, a sound, a, sound uh, uh, a disease outbreak um, occurred amongst a lot of different finch species. So pine siskins. So a lot of people needed to take down their bird feeders for a month or two. Um, so paying attention to the news and keeping a clean bird feeder should be the only people that put up bird feeders, if that makes sense. We have another question um, from Marilyn. Is there any humane way to stop flickers or other woodpecker types from drilling into wood, wooden home siding? Don't wanna hurt them, but they can also do a lot of damage. Okay, so the only reason why birds will either be drilling a hole into your home is because woodpeckers will drill into dead, uh, dead trees so to make cavities and your home is a dead tree because it's not, it's not live wood, right? So um, it just depends on what, why it's drilling. Now, if it's making a cavity, a hole about this size, a um, couple inches in uh, diameter, then it's looking for a home to live in. If it's drilling tiny holes, that means you probably have an insect problem and it's trying to get termites or a different uh, carpenter ants or something that's living in your siding. So those are the two things you want to look for. Now, if it's the big cavity of where it's trying to nest, um, a best way, the best way to keep those away, it's really tough, but having streamers, like those like silver streamers hang down, but preventing it from making any damage before it does. Um, you know, having sprinklers out or something like that could be a deterrent, but once it's invested in an area, even if it, you shoo it away by you know, putting something over that cavity, it'll probably move right next to it. So it's more that preventative maintenance, but it's really tough because we live in their habitat and we live in basically dead trees. Another question from Stuart is, should we expect a reoccurrence of the infected birds migrating through the region next summer? Um, I don't think so. It just happens sometimes. Um, you know, you get botulism and waterfowl occasionally with pelicans and it, it it just depends on diseases just like humans um, when there's just influx in, in, in disease spread. Um, but it's just important to keep, keep oh, be aware of local news of what's happening, but I don't expect it to happen again so soon because it was such a big outbreak, but birds seem to be doing fine now. And I like to put up hummingbird feeders in the summertime um, for in the Sierra Nevada. And I only like to put out, put out bird seed in the winter time for birds that have a, a really tough time finding food in the snow. So that's my per personal preference. I don't put out seed in the summertime because there's enough 
food source outside that the birds can find. But in the summer, I give um, nectar to hummingbirds. Great. Thank you all so much for your questions. And if anyone else has any more questions, I know Sarah had previously mentioned to me that in our email of the recording, which will be sent out to everyone, we will also send out her contact information, her email address. So if you have any other questions, please, and she also put it in the chat. So feel free to reach out to her. Um, and before we leave, I know our executive director, Jenny Hatch, has uh, a statement that she would love to give. So I'll pass it over to her. Thank you, Alexa. I just wanted to say thanks to Sarah um, and Tins for being here today and presenting um, and all of you guys for attending. I love it. I love these webinars. I love, you know, especially right now with COVID, it's reinvigorating for me to see our community gathering around natural um, science. So thank you for everyone for being here. Thanks for um, presenting a wonderful lecture, Sarah. And at the Alliance, you know, our big, one of our big missions is to elevate conservation organizations and be the hub for conservation in the Sierra. And TINS is one of those organizations that we love to support. Um, if you make donations to us, it goes to them too and resources that we provide. And, um, you know, likewise donating to them is wonderful. So want to elevate them and show them to you guys as a really great organization working here in the region. And, Will, their executive director has been a longtime friend of mine and played music with my husband. And they're just, it's a really great organization doing great research and education. So thank you, thank you. And I think that was all I, I had to say, just it's a joy to be here with you all today. <laughs> and thank you, Jenny. I just saw, I just saw that you're on here. So thanks so much for having me. Mm -hmm. um, it's always very interesting giving presentations when you can't see an audience. So. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed themselves today. If you have any questions, um, you can always email me at sarah at tins.org. If you have more questions about our organization, www.tinsweb.org. Uh, and then look forward to working with uh, the Sierra Nevada Alliance with other um, uh, things that we have in terms of outreach and education in the future. So th thanks again for having me today. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, just a, one last note, a recording of our webinar will be available on our website. Um, so please feel free to check that out. We will also send out an email to everyone. Um, and thank you. I hope you all have a happy new year and hopefully we'll be in touch soon with another webinar for next month. So thank you all so much and have a lovely rest of your day. Yeah, just say if you guys have ideas or things that you'd like to hear topics on, please email us and let us know. Um, we definitely want to do things that are beneficial to you. 